How many of you are completely surprised you've lived this long? <laughs> I, I, most of you are men, but there's a handful of women saying, I don't know how I did it, but you know. I, I am grateful for every day I get. I don't take it for granted because I know I should have been dead several times over in my life and God spared me. Yes. And so when God has allowed us to live this long, there must be purpose for our life. There must be things to accomplish in our life. And uh, um, it, it's amazing to me that, that how much people take life for granted. As a matter of fact, it's amazing to me how much people waste life. They waste it in worry. They waste it in fear. They waste it in anger. They waste it in retribution. They waste it in worry. Let me tell you something. Worry doesn't get you nowhere. Because you worry about things and it doesn't happen. And then you're surprised it didn't happen. But you wasted all that time worrying about it. Having no worry is faith but in the wrong thing. You're believing for the bad when it takes just as much energy to believe for the good to happen. Okay, I'm preaching to about three people here today. The rest of you just showed up. As we, and this is what I do as a pastor, is as we come to the end of the year, it's a good time to start over. It's a good time to just turn over a new leaf. I, I'm, I'm like you, sister. I don't do a whole lot of resolutions because I fail them every time. I am going to work at losing some weight. Hallelujah. How it's going to happen, I got no clue. But we're going to work at it by George. I, and, and I'm, matter of fact, I'm doing something here, and I've talked about it with you uh, recently. Um, I'm, I'm going on a trip, a missions trip here real quick and, uh, to a part of the world I've never been to. And so I want you to be aware of it. Uh, I've been trying to communicate this from the pulpit. Um, I'll actually be gone this coming weekend to the third world nation of Oklahoma. <laughs> Pray for me, brothers and sisters. I've got, a, I've got a buddy who's a cowboy pastor up near the Lawton, Oklahoma area, and his, him and his wife are celebrating 30 years. And uh, he had asked me over a year ago, would you come renew our vows for us? And I was like, your first ones didn't work? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, are they broke? But uh, we're going we're gonna to drive up there this coming weekend and uh, be with them uh, and then stay over and preach at the Arena Cowboy Church in Lawton, Oklahoma um, next Sunday. Come home on Sunday, wash clothes, and on, on Monday and then on Tuesday, board a plane for Liberia, Africa. And uh, I'm going to be asking for your prayers uh, as I go to Africa. And uh, it's in West Africa. Somebody say, watch out for lions and, and you know, elephants and all that. That's on the other side of Africa. What I got to watch out for is Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like for you to be praying for me as I go to Africa. I'll leave on the 9th. I'll be back on the 20th. And... Uh, be in church. I'll be dragging my jet lag self in here on the 21st to come be with you. And I want to see all your happy, smiling faces. Okay? So I want you to hear this from your pastor. I love you very much. Behave while I'm gone. I feel like mom and daddy, you know? Yeah, I'm going to be gone for a little while. So you're not going to be able to get hold of me, but I'm grateful, grateful, grateful that if, if there is any issue, you can get hold of, of Lynn, our secretary. She's got everything on 911. Stand by. You can get hold of our board. Uh, got some great people taking care of that. You can get hold of Ben Daniel, uh, who, who works with me uh, like an associate pastor. I want you to, you can get hold of any of them and they'll, they'll take care of you if there's any problem. If you try to get hold of me, my phone is going to be off. I don't know if this is a mission trip or vacation. I don't know because I get to turn my phone off. But uh, would you be, just be praying for me? Have you been praying for your pastor And uh, uh, while I'm over there? I would very, very much appreciate it. You never know what's going to happen in life. You never know where you're going to go. You never know, you're, never, you're just sometimes unprepared for what that next phone call may be or that next situation or the next time you get in your car. As a pastor, I end my year by looking towards the next year thinking, 
And this may sound morbid to you, but this is my life. Who's going to die this year? Because I do a lot of funerals. I also wonder who's going to get married. <laughs> Somebody's kind of saying, well, it's about the same, you know. I heard that coming from that area. I heard some of that. Who's going to have kids this year? Uh, um, you know, I can't help but wonder as a pastor what the year holds. Uh, who uh, uh, Who's going to get mad at me this coming year? Because I'll tell you right now, if I haven't made you mad yet, just get a number and I'll get to you as soon as I can. Because I'm a man and I'm... <laughs> Come on, ladies. Men just make you angry. Come on. <laughs> but who's who's going to be with us next year? Who's going to be new family here at Maxdale Cowboy Church? I love that thought. We never know what's going to happen. We never know what's going to take place. But we should live in such a place as that not only are we ready, but we're able to say, well, bring it, Jesus. Just bring it. Because I don't know about you, I've lived my life enough as a younger man in a lot of fear and frustration. I used to be a news hound. Man, I used to be all about the news. I, I had Fox News getting all the stuff. I'm reading the newspaper. I had Rush Limbaugh on. Any Limbaugh heads out there? Okay. Man, I I, I didn't like the other guys because they argued too much. And uh, But I liked Rush. I liked listening to him. And, uh, but I found out that uh, the more I listened to the news, the more I watched it, the more I absorbed it, uh, I became more depressed and more frustrated. And I realized why. I'm feeding myself a steady diet of bad news. I mean, think about what's going on today. If you And, and I, it's not that I don't keep up with things. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at news headlines every day. I ain't catch enough through the news headlines. I don't have to immerse myself in the rest of it. But I do want to keep up with what's going on in the world today. And if you're paying attention, you're looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and all the fighting that's going on over there in Israel. And uh, I am so... Un I guess I'm just revealing who I am. I get so frustrated at our news that tries to say, well, Israel's trying to find a victory in this somehow. Israel's been attacked again and again and again from this people that live within it. Do you understand what the Palestinian areas where they rule Gaza, where they rule uh, uh, Bethlehem, if you want to see Jesus' birthplace, uh, uh, that's a Palestinian ruled area, Jericho. And to think of, if you, when they talk about a two-state system, think about this. You know what? We're going to carve out a piece of Texas that goes from uh, Austin uh, uh, up to Dallas down to Houston and form a triangle right there, and we're going to make it a whole nother state. Think about that. Suddenly you lose this chunk of your state, and it's going to become something else, and all they do is attack you. Brother Mike, you're getting pretty political. No, not really, but I need you to understand what's taking place. Their own land is taken from them and used against them. And it's amazing to me how, how, how much anti-Semitism is just off the chart. It's, it's like, man, we just want to tell you how much we hate Israel. We hate the Jews. And that blows me away. Where's the NAACP on this? Where's the ACLU on this? you got all these people that will fight for the rights of other groups. Why not fight for these because they're being, they're being targeted by their nationality? Come on, somebody hear me today? Okay. You have uh, the flood of, of illegal immigration that's coming into America. You have a totally upside-down economy. Uh, you have greater political divide in this nation. You have an uncertainty of elections. We have elections and we don't know that we can trust the election process. Is, are we actually getting what we voted for? And America is becoming not only more and more anti-Israel, but America is becoming more and more anti-church. And I look at all that stuff and crime's going up and this is going up, that's going up, and I start getting depressed. Is anybody with me? Have you got depressed from me talking for the last five minutes? I can't take a steady diet of that. I can't handle that. 
And that's just a few of the things that's coming across. That's just a, uh, the tips of the iceberg of what we deal with as Americans. And listen, before you'll ever hear me gripe about my nation because I'm an American and I vote and I have the right to gripe, if you didn't vote, you don't get to gripe. That was a very weak amen. High five me. I think that was pretty good. Pretty good point there. But I will tell you right now, before you start bashing America, realize we live in probably the greatest nation in the world. Why? We're free. Now I get frustrated because I feel like my freedoms are being curtailed. But at the end of the day, I'm going to Liberia, Africa, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to be saying, Oh, thank God I'm American. Because other nations don't have it as good as we do. We are blessed because of who our God is and we've stood on the side of Jesus Christ. But anymore, I refuse to live life under depressing circumstances. Not if I don't have to. Boy, if I can get on a horse and go for a ride, I want to do it. If I can get on my four-wheeler and go for a ride, I want to do it. If I can't do nothing else but turn on the TV and watch somebody else go on a horse ride, hallelujah, I'm going to do something that brings me peace. And sometimes that's hard to do. It's hard to do because we don't know how to let go. It's hard to do because we've conditioned ourselves to be negative. Listen to me for the next few minutes, friend, and we'll dismiss you in time for lunch. I promise you. But I need you to hear this. Science. Science says that there's a neurological reason for the cycle of negative thinking that we fall into. There's this little piece in your brain called the amygdala and it's that part of the brain that's believed to play a key role in your emotions. Uh, it becomes aroused. It remains in that state for a long time. Whatever that emotion is, it's stirred towards it. Fear, happiness, uh, uh, surprise, depression, all these sorts of things. And at the same time, a memory of the situation becomes imprinted into that part of the brain and, uh, and it makes... Uh, uh, the more emotional the situation, the stronger the memory will be. How many of you can remember some pretty traumatic times from your childhood? How many of you can remember what you wore yesterday? How many can remember what you had for breakfast yesterday? And, uh, I'm, <laughs> you know, you got the younger people. They're like, oh, I know all that. Okay, fine. Congratulations, you. You know. You get to that certain age. I remember 30 years ago pretty clearly 30 minutes ago as a struggle. But we have these things where there was a traumatic moment or, or, or it was a really good moment and it's imprinted. There's a lot of our childhood we can't remember, but we for sure remember those things and you'll hear a sound, you'll smell a smell. Are you with me? You'll see something and there's a trigger that goes on and it takes you back. It takes you back to that point. I'll smell something and it'll remind me of school. Uh, uh, growing up as a kid out here in Florence I'll, or, or, or growing up on the farm or something like that. We'll, we'll have these little things and it's because this has taken place. There in that piece of your brain, you had a situation that was of, uh, uh, of high emotion and that memory, a picture of that memory with that thing goes together and it's stuck inside of you. And... Over time, specific memories become attached to certain emotions. For example, feeling nervous uh, may bring back the memory of being fired from a job from years ago and the feeling is perpetuated. It just keeps going. And this can continue for a long period, which is known as flooding. You're flooded with this emotion. You're, you're bombarded with this sense of feeling and it's like you can't get out from underneath it. How do you know what I'm talking about? And every negative event you've ever experienced seems to come to mind suddenly and overwhelmingly. Here's one of mine. Here's one of mine. And I'm, if you say this to me, I'm probably going to punch you in the nose, okay? Here's one of mine. When, the, when I get a phone call, and it's usually from my secretary, whoever my secretary is at the time, and, uh, and I'll get this because this happened several years ago Pastor, we need to talk. Apparently, you don't know how ominous that sounds. Okay, let me put it in this perspective. 
Sir, you come home from work. You come from home from wherever and you see your wife standing there and she says, Buddy, we need to talk. Okay, I'm seeing some recognition happening across here. <laughs> I saw some wide eyes. <laughs> My amygdala just got overwhelmed, Pastor Mike. Yeah. I have moments where I get a phone call from somebody in the church and they say, Pastor Mike, we need to talk. That has the same connotation. Something's not right. And you go into this, this mode of, I've got to fix it. I've got to deal with it. Something's wrong. And uh, uh, that's, that's something that I have to contend with when I hear those words. Well, this is what this situation does. And you get flooded. I don't know what your triggers are, but we have these things and we get flooded with this emotion. And the process was probably created by God to help us sur survive uh, whatever we're going through and to prepare us for the worst things that could happen uh, as a negative emotion uh, alarm bell start going off and demanding our attention. It's telling us, hey, something's wrong. Pay attention. Something's wrong. And meanwhile, the body's producing these fight or flight hormones. I don't know if I need to whoop somebody or run away or both. Negativity, science tells us, isn't all bad. Some psychologists believe that if you're a pessimist, that you have some advantages in life. The pessimists are those who expect the worst, and they're often more resourceful because they're prepared for things to go wrong. See, I told you. The problem with pessimism is you're expecting everything to go wrong at every moment. And if something goes right, you're waiting for what's right to go wrong. Um, man, I must be stepping on some toes here today. And so we condition ourselves to look for the negative, to look for what's wrong, to look for what's bad, uh, instead of believing something good can happen. Feeling down can encourage us. To be alone for a while with God, it gives us a chance to have some insight, to give God a chance to speak to us, a chance to, to, to get our strength back. If I'm down, it ought to drive me to God and not to something else. Somebody hearing me. That's what should happen in your life. Depression, however, takes it tends to make people more cautious and slow to act. We're not sure what to do. We're scared to do anything. And becomes clear later that the feeling was a signal that the time wasn't right. Decisions and actions uh, uh, were not as confident in doing because we're afraid. We're afraid. And what it all can boil down to is the fact that I'm not a confident person. You are not a confident person. You're not confident in yourself or you're not confident in your God. Somebody hear me today. And we worry. And we don't realize it, but in our worry, we begin to ask, how can I be confident? Because I don't know how to get confident. Because I'm not even thinking about God at the moment. All I'm thinking about is what's wrong with me. What's wrong with my situation. Let me tell you something, friend. You came to church, so you asked for this. If you're in any situation, God is there with you. As a matter of fact, God got there before you did. And God's already planned on how you're going to get out of that situation. God's got you or God's a failure. God's a liar. And so I have to trust God. How do I get my confidence? My confidence has to come from God. Look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're going to quickly go through this. There's some guys that are listed there called David's Mighty Men. Now, if you're a guy, you're really going to like this. If you're a female, I hope you really like this. <laughs> These are David's Mighty Men. They're great warriors that fought along David for God and country. So it starts at verse 8. It says, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Bath, uh, uh, Bathsheba, the Tachmanite, Chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Ezanite because he had killed 800 men at one time. That's a bad man. That's a bad man. I don't think I could whoop two. 
unless they're even smaller than me. <laughs> I might whoop three. Killed 800 men. And after him was Eleazar the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of three mighty men with David when they uh, defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. They literally had to pry his hand open to get the sword out of it. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. Stop right there. Here's your free sermon. Be weary of the people who aren't willing to do the work with you, but they're willing to get all the reward from you. You do not need buzzards in your life. You do not need leeches in your life. A true friend, a true brother, a true sister is one that's going to go through with you. And they deserve the plunder alongside you. And it says, After him was Shammah the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field. He defended it, and he killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the thirty men uh, went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Ajulam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. And David was... Then in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now watch this. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Those guys were awesome. Man, they, they fought tooth and toenail just to go get that brother a drink of water. And look at what David did. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it for me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. I don't know about you, but I probably hit David right square upside the head. <laughs> I did all that. You're going to pour it on the ground for the Lord. Okay. Some of y'all more spiritual than me. And he said, uh, Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief of the other of another three. He lifted a spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among these three. Was he not the most honored of three? Therefore he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. This is fascinating stuff to me. Because these are bad men in their own right. They're able to kill hundreds of people. Matter of fact, you didn't join this group unless you were bad. You whooped folk. You killed them. You didn't get to join this group unless... And it says these guys did incredible things, yet they didn't make it to the top three. How bad were they? But you see, these men rallied to David because David was a fighter. David was a fighter. David, uh, uh, David was in the right cause. He was a man of intense faith. Here are these men who ought to be leading their own armies and they're going to David. That tells you something about David himself. David had a lot of failures in his life, but I will tell you this. David was a charismatic man and he loved the Lord and he wanted to see God's people survive. God and country are noble causes and a sudden invasion can cause you to act bravely. But you are brave and confident because it's who you are. You can't get brave. you got to be brave. And I want you to see this because this needs to be imprinted in your mind. Circumstances do not dictate your character. They reveal it and become the opportunity to develop, refine, and grow it. Your circumstances are not going to dictate your character. It's just going to reveal it. You're going to act some way, and when the chips are down, you're going to become the real you. And people are going to see the real you. So your circumstances aren't going to make you, they're going to reveal you, because you're made in what you're doing in your daily habits. So that's interesting to me. So let's keep going. Now there's a guy by the name of Benaiah, and he was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from Kabzil. 
who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also, now pay attention to this, he also had gone down and killed the lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand and he went down with his staff, wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own weapon. That's a bad man. The, these things Benaiah the son of Jehoiada did and he won a name among the mighty three men who were more honored. He was more honored than uh, the 30, but he did not attain to the first three and David appointed him over his guard. Here's the point of that. Leave that. Why, why on earth? Yeah, go back one more. Go back one more. And he had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Now think about this. You're traveling along. It's snowing. There's a big hole in the ground. You look down in there and there's a lion. And he's mad. And he's hungry. And he's been down there a while. And he's ready to eat something he wants to get out of there. Have you just willing to say, cool. You laugh, but that's what he did. He went down, he just decided he's going to jump down in there. And, you know, why attempt something that doesn't matter? That lion's there. It's going to die. Why on earth are you going to go down there? Was he trying to keep it from suffering? It's a man-eating lion. He needs to suffer. Hallelujah. Was he trying to impress people? No. I don't think that's what he was doing. I believe he went down there because he could. Just because he could. It was there. I know I can do it. And he went down there just to kill that lion. Here's what I want you to see. Fear will dominate your life due to the possibilities of failure. Somebody listen to me right now. Fear will dominate your life due to the possibilities of failure and whatever circumstances they may bring. What, hap what could happen? I might, I might die. I might go bankrupt. I, I can't do this because I might get divorced. I might lose my job. I, I might experience pain. I might experience heartache. But at the same time, you might succeed. You might succeed. Understand this. No man wins who's afraid of losing. No man wins who's afraid of losing. I got tickled when I found out we have a national motocross champion in our midst. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, you walked out of here. You walked out of here while we were singing happy birthday. Shame on you. Did you know, did you know this lady right here is a national motocross champion? National. She's bad. She's bad. I heard stories. She'd be riding. She'd be, you know, zipping along that track. Some other woman come up next to her and she'd just reach out there and pow and just keep going. She don't play fair. Ask her husband. He'll tell you. She don't play fair. That woman would not win a national championship at that if she was afraid of falling down. She was afraid of getting hurt. You had to have fallen down plenty of times. You had to have gotten hurt plenty of times doing it. But the thrill of doing it was overriding the fear of doing it. You see, that's what life's supposed to be. And can I tell you, there are plenty in this building right now, you're afraid to live because of what might happen. Well, I might lose my money. You're going to lose it anyway. Well, I'm afraid of what might happen. I'm, I'm afraid I might get hurt. You're going to get hurt anyway. Do you know what I call a good day? When I can put on my underwear in the morning and not fall face forward and hit my head on the floor. Okay, I got some people saying, Amen, brother. Amen. You know, we're not as dexterous as we used to be. But you're not going to win at life if you're afraid. Are you hearing me? 
So let me ask you this. Let's bring put a caboose on this. What is it that keeps you from faithfulness to God? What is it that's keeping you from faithfulness? Well, I don't want to pay my tithe. Do you know who gets upset when the preacher preaches a sermon on tithing? People who don't tithe. But it's the people who tithe that will say, Glory! It does work! It does work! And listen to me. I'm not here for your money. I'm here to help you get a blessing. Because I'm telling you, if you're not being blessed, you're negative. And I don't want to be around you because you're grouchy. I want you blessed because when you're blessed, you're a lot more fun to be around. Tithing works. Well, I don't know, Brother Mike. What if I run out of money? You're going to run out of money. Because let me give you a hint here. God loves you. But God's not here to make you happy. He's here to make you holy. And if you won't give God that 10% He requires, not Mike Sullivan, if you don't give God that 10% He requires, He'll make sure you don't get to keep it. Somebody hear me. Well, that's me. No, that's God trying to teach you a lesson. Be faithful with what belongs to Him. What is it that keeps you from committing your life to God? What is it that keeps you from committing uh, uh, your family? What keeps you out of church? What's the thing that just keeps you out of church and, 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 and attending on a regular basis? Or what is it that's in your life that keeps you from stepping out in faith? And it may not have anything to do with here. God may be trying to get you to start a new business and you're afraid to do it. He may be trying to get you to start a new occupation. He may be trying to get you to, you know, you're 40 years old, you're 50 years old, and He's trying to get you to take a new step in life and try something new. What is it that's keeping you from doing that? Fear? Listen, we're all going to fail at something, but it just might be we succeed at something. Especially when God's in it. Well, I'm afraid to lose a relationship. I'm, I'm afraid to, uh, uh, you know, I'm going, I'm going to step out here and nothing happens. Let me tell you something. I've had moments where God has very, very well told me, Mike, do this because this is what I want you to do. I do it and it doesn't work. Can I tell you something? People can thwart the will of God on a daily basis. If you don't believe me, when was the last time God told you to do something and you didn't do it? You thwarted the will of God. God's ultimate will will take place. And God has told me moments where this is what I want in your life and it didn't happen and I'd have to say, hey God, what's up? And God said, don't worry about it. Give it back to me. I got something better for you. Can I tell you, anytime man has let me down, God has made it even better in my life. What are you afraid of? What are you scared of? I don't know what 23 has been, but i tell you what 24 can be. It can be the best year you've ever had. It can be the gateway to the best part of life you've ever had. I don't care how old you are. You're not dead and in the grave yet. Honey, there's something still good that can happen in this life. We're living our best times right now. My good old days aren't when I was way back yonder. Can I tell you my good old days ought to be living right... Is somebody with me today? I ought to be living my best days right now because there will come a day when I can't do, but I can sit in that rocket chair and suck on my teeth and think back. Hopefully I have enough brain left. I can think back to them good old days. Why? Because I'm trying to live my good old days. We're trying to live our best life right now and we live it because we're not afraid. Why? Because my God goes before me. My God leads me. My God protects me. My God provides for me. It's a good life. What is it about your life that you're feeling isn't so great? That's what you've got to take to God. I can't do that for you. You've got to do that yourself. What is it about your life that you hate? What is it about your life that you keep sticking in a hole? What is it about your life that keeps you? It keeps you from joy. It keeps you from happiness. What is the failures of your past that you keep beating yourself up with instead of letting it go? Oh, Brother Mike, I made some bad mistakes. <laughs> I have too. But I ain't going to linger in it. Learn from it. Don't do that again. I won't stick my finger in a light socket. What did I learn? Don't do that again. My wife's going to hold up a dress to me and say, does this make me look fat? Don't do that again. 
<laughs> There's a good chance to say amen on that one. You guys are cowards. Cowards. Okay. Yeah. Now that your wife's saying you're here. I'm trying to close the service. Y'all need to stop. Y'all need to stop. So here's here's what you need to do. I said all that to say this. Give it to God. Give it to God. Give your fears. Give your worries. Give your doubts. Give your past failures. Give your past triggers. Listen, I can't live my life wondering if I'm going to trigger something bad in you. i got to live. If you're going to fall to pieces, you're just going to have to fall to pieces. But I'm not falling to pieces with you. Instead, I want you to go with me to a better place. Bow your heads with me. At this moment, the Holy Spirit is bringing some things to your mind that you need to let go of. Personal failures, personal shortcomings, fears, doubts, worries. For somebody here today, this is really resonating with you. And I'm telling you, God wants to lead you to a better place in life. So Lord Jesus, right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you see what we deal with. Lord, I don't have to have somebody tell me where I fall short. I don't have to have somebody tell me what my fears are. I already know what they are. So Lord, what I pray today is deliver us from our fears. Come on church, pray with me. Lord, I'm giving you my fears, I'm giving you my doubts, I'm giving you my worries, I'm giving you my failures, I'm giving you these things that hold me back and Satan has no problem beating me with them. But instead, Lord God, of hiding in shame, I'm going to let my failures be a trophy of your grace. Instead of saying, what if, Lord, in 2024, I want to start saying, even if. Instead of what if, I want to say, even if. Even if this happens, even if it fails, I'm going to do this thing. Because I believe God is in it. Father, I'm believing for somebody to find some freedom this next year from the things that have held them back. And Father God, I'm believing in 2024 people to find their place in their destiny. People to find themselves soaring where they've been inching by. God, I'm believing for something good to happen in people's lives because they've let the past be in the past. Let that fear fly out the window and instead they're going to have some faith that just might be God's going to do something. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the people here. I thank you, Lord God, because I believe, I believe we are living our best days right now. Help us to live our best days right now, God. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this church. Most importantly, I thank you for Jesus that gives us the chance at a new life. Lord, we give you glory right now in Jesus' name. Somebody love the Lord said amen. 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 Pastor Ben, come and close our service for us. Don't forget all the don't forget all the announcements that are in your bulletin there. Thanks, come on. Amen. I'd like our uh, praying elders.